This morning we are uh, continuing our series on uh, some of our forefathers in the faith and looking at Genesis chapter 16 as we look at Abram and Sarai and, uh, and their, uh, also, also Hagar as part of this. So as you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to Genesis 16. Uh, if you don't, they will be up on the screen, but always um, we, we are so blessed by having the scriptures available to us in our own language. It is, uh, it, it is wonderful to be able to have that before us. So Genesis 16, as you're able, I invite you to stand as we open God's word together. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had borne. May God add his blessing to this word. Please be seated. Well, you know, this is yet another challenging story from the lives of our forefathers of faith. As we get to this point in the story, Abram should be doing well. Uh, He's received and followed a call from God and has received a remarkable covenant with him. Abram has become wealthy. Uh, In previous chapters, we've learned he has more than 300 servants who are trained in battle. And he's proven his power. Again, just a chapter before, or a couple of chapters before this, he rescued his nephew Lot by defeating four kings, or at least city rulers, which five kings working together couldn't do. But Abram was able to do it. But Abram and Sarai are fixated on the one thing they don't have a son. God promised them many descendants, but Abram doesn't have even one child. So Sarai devises this plan to to help God and get her own way. She gives Abram her servant as a concubine. Abram lets her take the lead. He doesn't seem to have any problem with this for some reason. But then she turns on Hagar and vice versa. Abram lets her mistreat Hagar, and Hagar runs away. 
These are messed up people. Let's be honest. But the deep flaws in the ancestors of the nation of Israel, in fact, ancestors of Jesus himself, to me, they speak of the reality of these stories. Nobody would make this stuff up. It's frankly kind of embarrassing. We want to keep our family skeletons in the closet, not air them in Scripture. But these messy stories show us not only the reality of Abram and Sarai, but the reality of God, of his moral laws, of his great worthiness, and of his grace. So I'd like us to look this morning together at, at some lessons that we can draw from this particular episode in their lives about how we should trust God today. The first thing that occurs to me as we look throughout this story is that moral laws are real. Now, people have made great strides in understanding the universe from thinking that the sun revolved around the earth to sending up the Webb Space Telescope, which has been bringing us such amazing images of the universe. We've sent people to the moon and robotic cars to drive around Mars. We even sent a probe to an asteroid and brought a sample back this week. But there's a lot we still don't understand. To explain the way that distant stars and galaxies are behaving, scientists have had to come up with dark energy and dark matter, which can't be directly observed. But for it to make sense, about 68% of the universe would have to be dark energy and another 27% dark matter, which leaves just 5% of the universe being things we can currently observe and try to understand. Just in case you're ever inclined to think that scientists have everything figured out. But even so, for our lives, the natural laws that Newton and Galileo described still apply. They're a thing. We all recognize this. Unless you're Wiley e. Coyote, you can't just run off a cliff and expect to be okay. Well, this episode in the lives of Abram and Sarai show us that there are moral laws of the universe as well. And we can't get around those any more effectively than we can get around gravity. Today, we increasingly define what's right and wrong by whether anybody gets hurt. We've made right and wrong subjective, so if we don't think anybody got hurt, it's okay. Run a red light and didn't hit anybody, and there wasn't a cop nearby, well, it's okay. Call in sick just to take a day off, well, they don't pay you enough anyway. Have a cashier forget to ring up something in your cart? Well, bonus. We make movies that glorify smart, good-looking, sophisticated criminals who get away with a big heist and jet off into the sunset. And we love stories about dumb criminals who fall way short of that. Like the woman in Somerset, Massachusetts, who broke into a home and stole several valuables. The police caught her pretty quickly, though, because it turned out she was wearing a GPS ankle bracelet <laughs> because she was on probation for breaking and entering. Or the German bank robber who sent mocking emails to local police. He'd seen on the news that their efforts to arrest him, and he wanted to let them know that they have his age, build, and accent all wrong. He said, they said he escaped on foot. No, he had a getaway car. But the cops actually got the last word in because they arrested the guy just a few hours later after tracing his emails. Why do we love stories like this? Because we feel smarter than those idiots. I could have gotten away with it. And you know, in many ways, the religions around Abram and Sarai and many religions today are about outsmarting the gods. 
if you perform the right rituals, if you give the gods food and provision, they'll do good things for you. It's like a vending machine. If you feed them, the gods don't really care what your morals are like. Besides, those gods didn't have much room to talk. The stories of the gods were full of adultery, rape, incest, pride, vanity, deception, power struggles. So the lesson of the prevailing religion was do the right rituals and then do what you have to do to get ahead and be happy. But what the Lord is revealing to Abram is he's not that kind of God. He doesn't need people to provide for him. He created the universe and every one of us. And he holds everything together with a word. He's all-knowing and all-powerful. We're not going to outsmart him. And he created the universe not just with physical laws, but with moral ones. He says it matters how you live. And it matters who you are. Our hearts matter. He didn't do that just to set up arbitrary rules for the fun of it. There are laws that align with who he is, a being of infinite goodness, purity, truth, and love. Just as the laws of the natural world reflect his order, so the moral laws written on our hearts and revealed through his word reflect his character. And what Abram and Sarai Sarai experience is that the moral laws that God baked into the universe are true regardless of what we think of them, regardless of the justifications that we make for ourselves. And just looking at this one episode, we can see, first, that these laws hold true regardless of consent. You know, it seems with what's going on here, kind of looks like everybody consented to this arrangement. Sarai suggested it. Abram certainly agreed with it. And we aren't told exactly what Hagar thought about the whole thing. I want to be very careful here. But going from a slave to a wife would have elevated her status significantly within a wealthy and powerful family. And she clearly flaunted that promotion after she became pregnant. We can find ourselves thinking that as long as everyone involved consents to what's happening, well, there's nothing wrong. As long as people consent what they do in a bedroom, married or not, male, female, it doesn't really matter. And if a married couple agrees to get a divorce for whatever reason, that's fine despite the fact that Jesus pointed to male and female becoming one flesh as the design for marriage and saying what God has joined together, let no one separate. If everyone's having fun getting drunk, it's fine, despite the fact that God's word says, do not get drunk on wine, which is debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. If the buyer and seller of a car agree to underreport the sale price so the buyer pays less tax, it doesn't hurt anybody. Except Jesus clearly said to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. You know, that last one actually happened to me a few years ago. And I did the wrong thing. I caved in the moment and went along. And my wife was very helpful in showing me the error of my ways. We tried to make it right by figuring out how to make a use tax payment to the state for the difference, but I still had fallen in the moment. Even if everybody involved is in agreement, going against God's moral laws is still wrong. And it's also wrong regardless of our culture. You know, this arrangement in Genesis 16 actually seems to have been relatively common in the ancient Near East. A major function of marriage was to continue the family line. So if a wife failed to give birth to an heir, there were different options. Her husband might divorce her or take a second wife. 
Or, similar to what happened here, a servant or slave could essentially become a surrogate, with the baby being, produ- being considered the child of the primary wife. You know, prenups are not all that new. They found marriage contracts from about 4,000 years ago, the time of Abram and Sarai. <clears throat> and one of these reads, be glad maybe you don't have some of these names in your family, but, but if Gilimnenu bears children, Shanima shall not take another wife. But if Gilimnenu fail, fails to bear children, Gilimnenu shall get for Shanima a woman from the Lulu country as concubine. In that case, Gilimnenu herself shall have authority over the offspring. That's basically what happened with Abram and Sarai and Hagar. Culture said that what they were doing was okay. And we can be blinded by what our culture says is okay as well. For centuries, India practiced sati, the tradition of burning a widow alive on her husband's funeral pyre. Christian missionaries like William Carey and William Wilberforce found that in 1803, they did a survey, and more than 300 women were killed through sati in a 30-mile radius of Calcutta. The missionaries worked tirelessly to see that practice banned. And in 1829, the British government made sati illegal. Finally, in 1987, the independent government of India banned not only the practice, but also supporting or glorifying it. The question shouldn't be whether our culture says it's right. The question is whether God says it's right. And God's moral laws apply regardless of our intent. You know, Sarai intended to get to what God had promised them. It seemed right in her eyes. Maybe this is the way God wants to do this. God promised to give Abram a son, but he didn't specifically say it would be through me. But doing the wrong thing for what seems like the right reason is still doing the wrong thing. And by the way, doing the wrong thing, doing the right thing for the wrong reason is also sin. Jesus hammered this home in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it said, You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. God wants our actions to align with his character. And he wants our intentions to align with his character as well. Because ultimately, these moral laws of the universe reflect who God is. He is the only one worthy of our worship. So one way of looking at sin is saying that it is worshiping anything other than God. Idols, the natural world, money, pleasure, other people, ourselves, or as Abram and Sarai remind us, we can even worship God's promises over God himself. God had promised to give Abram a son, but ten years later, still no son. Sarai focused on the promise, not on God, so she took matters into her own hands. Perhaps I can build a family through her. God has made us promises too. Promises to give us healing. Promises to give us freedom. Promises to provide for our needs. Promises to give us joy. But we won't experience full healing until Jesus returns in glory. Freedom in Christ isn't the same as freedom to do whatever we want. God's promise to provide what we need doesn't mean we'll always get the things we want. We can mistake the feeling of happiness for the worldview of joy. 
We look at our lives and we wonder why God isn't doing anything yet. But He has the perspective of eternity. Sin takes our focus from what God has given us, life, His presence, the salvation He offers, the gift of eternal life. And it shifts our focus to the things that we don't have, things that are temporary. And so when He doesn't operate on our timetable, we can try, like Sarai, to fulfill His promises on our terms, in our strength, in our wisdom, and it usually doesn't go well because we're not focused on God. We're not focused on worshiping Him. We're worshiping His promises. And so Abram and Sarai's story reminds us that sin has consequences. Bringing another woman into Abram and Sarai's bedroom has consequences. Jealousy runs rampant. A wedge is driven between husband and wife. Sarai abuses Hagar, who runs away. It occurs to me there are some striking similarities between this sin and the sin that we see back in Genesis chapter 3 in the garden. Both of them begin with doubting God's trustworthiness. The serpent asks Eve, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And Sarai doubts God's ability to fulfill what he promised. In fact, she blames God for withholding the promise. The Lord has kept me from having children. Both sins involve the temptation of wisdom. Eve sees the fruit as desirable to make her wise. Sarai sees her plan as the smart way out. Neither Adam nor Abram stand up for what is right. They quietly go along when their wives go astray. In both cases, there is a sudden realization of the consequences of their sin. And in both cases, the sin drives a wedge in the middle of relationships. When things don't go our way, we quickly shift the blame, don't we? Adam blames Eve, and he blames God for creating her. Eve blames the serpent. Sarai says to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. And all sin separates us from God. You notice in Genesis chapter 16, Abram doesn't mention God at all. Sarai mentions him twice, but only to blame him for keeping her from having children and using his name to curse her husband. Sin denies who God is and refuses to trust him. Sin puts something else in the place of worship and turns away from the only one who is worthy of worship. And when we separate ourselves from the one who is truth and purity and love and life, all it leaves us with is lies and corruption and evil and decay. As Paul writes, for the wages of sin is death. All sin carries consequences. Whether we believe it or not, whether we see it immediately or not, and it leaves us broken weary and dead. But this story, praise God, it doesn't end with brokenness because God hears and God sees. Now that could sound like a threat, kind of like Santa Claus is coming to town, but what we see in the middle of this messy situation is that God shows up to the least likely person in the whole story. Not to Abram, not to Sarai, but to Hagar. To the runaway, abused Egyptian slave girl pregnant with her master's child. She's a victim. And she is not without fault. She despised and turned on Sarai out of pride. And God's message to her is a challenging one. 
She should change her attitude, return to her dysfunctional family, and submit to Sarai, who had been abusing her. He says Hagar will have her child, and he will be strongly independent. He will submit to nobody, but his life will be marked by hostility. But the boy's name reveals powerful, powerful grace. Ishmael, God hears, for the Lord has heard of your misery. And Hagar rejoices that God has seen even her and that she has seen who God is. So she returns. And Abram trusts God's word through Hagar. And when the child is born, he gives him the name that God commanded her, Ishmael. God hears. And there is hope and grace for us in this story too. Because when we deny who God is and the moral laws that are built into his character, when we turn from him and make excuses about our sin, when we prefer decay and death over purity and life, he hears us. He sees us. While we were his enemies, he loved us enough to come to us, to be born as one of us, And this Jesus lived a life perfectly aligned with those moral laws. Not the traditions and legalism of men, but perfectly demonstrating what it means to love God and love our neighbor. And he took on himself the penalty that our sin deserved so that our record could be wiped clean, our relationship to God reconciled, and our future restored so that we can walk in all of his promises for all of eternity. Paul doesn't end with, for the wages of sin is death. He continues, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the question for us today is, Have you seen the one who sees you? If you have, turn around. Leave your sin and your excuses behind. Follow him. Worship him. Trust him. Because he hears you. He sees you. And he loves you.